I was introduced to Carrie McCarpet when she did a collaboration with Inmendum a few years ago. She was primarily a vegan YouTuber, but her most recent stuff has been more focused on psychology and internet issues. In this particular video she just uploaded is about a subject I am interested in, uh, depression and psychological suffering, and I believe that she is working with some false premises and her video offered no solutions, so I think it's worthy of a response. If you're going to say something is a social problem, then you have to explain why, and then offer a solution, like how Inmendum does. If you don't carefully examine your own thoughts and find the logical mistakes, someone will have to do it for you, and so that's where this response video comes in. So her premise is that depression, and I assume she means clinical depression, and not just a case of the Mondays, is being caused by television and the internet. This seems to assume that depression didn't exist before the 1940s. This will probably come as a shock to no one, but this particular antinatalist has been diagnosed with major depressive disorder, also known as clinical depression, uh, by more than one psychiatrist. So coping with my mental anguish has always been a preoccupation, or you can even call it a hobby of mine, for decades. And I really hate to see videos like this that are confusing and don't make a lot of sense. I've tried just about every depression, quote unquote, cure. There is, uh, including almost every antidepressant drug, so I know what works and what doesn't. The topic of McCarpet's video is not just depression, but a very useful technique that has gained popularity of late called mindfulness. I was like a modern youngster. You know, when other people were out socializing, I didn't do that as much. I watched way too much TV, and as a result, I started having a sense that reality was like a film set, like nothing had any substance to it. Everything looked like it was made of plastic or polystyrene. And there was like this terrible feeling, there's something missing. I don't know what it is. I feel the need to pursue something, but it I can't tell what. There's just an emptiness going on here. And I thought it was straightforward depression. Interestingly enough, you'll be the judge of that, but other people my age didn't feel this, but that's because they were out socializing. And now it seems that young people talk about this feeling much more because they're all behaving in a similar way, spending way too much time with screens and not enough time in the real world. What made me understand the connection later was the fact that meditation made the emptiness stop. And that's when I realized what the mechanism of something like mindfulness is. Mindfulness meditation is the focus on your sensory perception. So your experience of colors and sounds and everything to the point where you're so concentrated on that you forget everything else. And then the other kinds of meditation ask you to empty your mind completely until you start even forgetting your sensory perception because those kinds want you to focus solely on the experience of being conscious. But both are asking you to do the same thing. They're asking you to pay attention to what is, what you can perceive, with such intensity that you crowd out everything that you can't perceive. So you get rid of thoughts of the past and future and thoughts of people who aren't there and things that aren't now. And in other words, you crowd out abstraction in favor of reality. So she sort of gets it. It's not a mystery why mindfulness works. It's been well studied and it's been around for thousands of years. It simply replaces emotion with observation. Less emotion equals less suffering. Uh, it's a way to be more like Spock, grounded and in control of our emotions. It has nothing to do with our brain bringing us back to quote unquote the real world. It does make us more aware of the present moment and our present surroundings, but if anything, it takes us out of the real world. It's more like this. It's removing all the stressful distractions in our life for a few minutes. That's really all this technique is for, dealing with stress. It's removing stimuli. So just like TV, it can be viewed as escapism. It's not really that deep of a subject. It's not spiritual. It's not religious. It's breathing practice, and it's one of the most calming techniques I've ever tried. I study and use techniques like this as an alternative to drugs like alcohol and Xanax. Uh, Xanax is a common way people deal with anxiety in the US. I've never tried it, but like with heroin, if it's that good, I don't want to try it because I've become dependent upon it. 
same thing with alcohol. If you start to use it as a coping mechanism, it can become a habit in only a week. And booze is harmful to the body, whereas mindfulness has no negative side effects, except that you have to make the time to do it. But honestly, even five minutes can have a significant effect. Now that practice, I would argue, is the exact opposite of watching TV, because with the latter, you sit down, defocus your mind, and engage with the illusion on screen, and pretend to yourself that it really is a portal to another world. Because the way you can watch actors and forget they are acting, just shows you how credulous a part of your brain is, even though you know consciously it's just a TV screen. And when we're doing this, we crowd out reality. You forget your situation. It's an emphatic no to the present moment. And you're replacing that with this authored abstraction. And you might be doing this for several hours a day. So if daily meditation practice has been shown to alter the brain's structure physically over time to improve a person's ability to focus and their capacity to live in the moment, uh, what it does is it reduces the activity in areas of the brain that are assigned to ruminating and chattering about stuff, then it stands to reason to me that watching TV every day might also change your brain physically in the opposite direction, and it might make it less engaged with the present moment. I ingest fictional stories in the form of books and TV shows constantly, day after day, like most of us do. And like most people, I understand the difference between fact and fiction. Perhaps what she is actually trying to suss out here is why people believe in gods, maybe? Christians, Muslims, and Buddhists all do the meditation thing, even if it's called prayer, and it doesn't seem to help them see that their gods aren't real. In other words, the truth about reality. Mindfulness is not a practice of faith. It's been scientifically proven to reduce suffering in people with depression and anxiety. I think that Carrie is projecting her own psychological history onto everyone else here. Mindfulness meditation is a practice based on research. It's not an escape from abstraction. It requires abstraction. For example, a skill from ACT, or ACT, a mindfulness strategy, is called cognitive diffusion. One of the diffusion techniques that has worked well for me is called leaves on a stream. It requires abstract thought and it is a way to detach ourselves from emotions or thoughts that are overwhelming us. It's a way of observing your thoughts as they enter your consciousness uh, from an external perspective. So you sit quietly and imagine a slowly moving stream or creek, remembering to breathe deeply and slowly as you would during meditation. When a thought comes into your consciousness, you put that thought on a leaf, and you can imagine it even like just the letters spelling out this particular thought and then you let it go. Observe the thought objectively without struggling with it. Just the act of putting it on a leaf that rolls away with the water really works well for me. And as it kind of goes down the stream and disappears from you know, my mind's eye, uh, the, the thought starts to dissipate as well. Another technique uh, is to give your anxious or depressing thoughts a, co a particular color. Try to describe your thoughts in terms of their size, weight, or hue and your brain will start to stop obsessing over them. I am an obsessive warrior, and if I didn't create abstractions to visualize my thoughts and control them, I probably would have to be drunk all the time. <laughs> I know it sounds too easy to be true, but these types of techniques really do work. It's not positive thinking bullshit, it's just a way to examine your thoughts without getting emotional or upset over them. It's a way to control your fight or flight response rather than letting it control you. So it's weird because a lot of us try to deal with our problems intellectually. That's, you know, talk therapy and stuff. But this is an experiential thing that you have to enter into as a practice of faith. And even though it doesn't seem like it's going to work, uh, the fact that so many people have done it throughout history means there's probably something in it. And I was amazed when I found that meditating by just sitting there for five minutes in the morning and at night, repeating a mantra with my eyes closed, you can repeat it out loud or in your head, I found that doing that over time, to the exclusion of all other thoughts as much as possible, started making reality look real. And it had never been that way as far back as I can remember. So I've only had reality for the past three years now. Doesn't that statement, I've only been in reality for a few years, sound like something a crazy person might say? 
where were you for the rest of your life then? Carrie makes it sound like she was literally living inside of her TV set for three years. It's because there is this potential for joy in ordinary things. It's just that telling a person who's depressed that doesn't mean they can access any of it. And again, you have to open the gates with force um, to allow yourself to feel this way. And that's what I think meditation does. It ups the ratio of your engagement with reality to your engagement with abstraction, things that aren't here and now. So I think the depersonalization uh, that some young people feel, the inability to live in the moment, or the fact that they just feel depressed, might be connected to a lifetime of the older generation training them to be concerned with things that don't exist. And some lies, you know, from marketers that, that they're not good enough. A lot of negative messages that are being delivered one-to-one -to, -one to these people. And the fact that they're put into pursuit mode forever because we've taught young people to believe um, this is as good as it gets. You know, we all love and socialize and connect at a constant remove. So there is no oneness. There's just ceaseless striving and longing and that's it. And if the depression thing was like that for me in the old days, just from watching TV, and if it's like this for youngsters using the internet now, what on earth is it going to be like uh, when augmented reality takes off and we're invited to constantly live in the world of abstraction? I mean, you've only got so much consciousness to go around. The more that's assigned to things that aren't real, the less capacity you have for connecting with the present moment. And it translates into joy, as it turns out. You know, it doesn't really sound relatable the way it's written in religions and spiritual traditions and all that but it turns out you your ability to connect with reality is what seems to give you access to a sense of well-being i wonder if carrie has ever heard of depressive realism reality doesn't provide quote unquote well-being whatever the hell that word even means reality is what causes us to be so anxious and depressed should I make myself more aware that there are dogs sitting in shelters all over the world who will never be adopted? Should I remind myself constantly that chickens are experiencing the definition of hell on earth, being tortured for their entire lives so that uncaring humans can eat the disgusting slime that comes out of them? How about I contemplate the reality of my future demise, where not only my body will be racked with pain and disease, but my mind will lose its sharpness, its ability to remember things that happened only moments ago, or even what year it is? That's reality. A reality McCarpet thinks we should all get more familiar with and embrace. Because it's not the fact that we were born into a carnage slaughterhouse that's got us down. No, it's the tube. An invention that clearly has made life more tolerable for most of us. Yes, it can also be used to brainwash people and probably raises the standard of beauty too high. But it doesn't have to be that way. When you think about, you know, the, the growth of the mindfulness movement, an idea that seeks to reunite people with reality. I mean, that's not a good sign, is it? That's possibly an indication that we're losing our grip on what really exists. The frustrating thing about this is the ancients always understood verisimilitude in art is dangerous. A lot of our art today is just taken up by people telling the rest of us what it's like to be them, and we get an insight into their world. And that's a reflection of our current societal problem where we don't have the connectivity we used to. So we probably don't hear from them first person how they're feeling. They have to express these things in therapy or in art. Tuning into the reality channel is not the reason to practice mindfulness. It's to quiet the aggravating voices inside of our heads. The stress from the traffic, the belligerent strangers, the annoying co-workers, the forced politeness we have to endure every day. Why do you think TV, video games, and YouTube are so popular? It's not because reality is so wonderful. <laughs> Again, where is the evidence for this? Where are the studies? Where is the meta-analyses in her video? Because if this is just her opinion, then why is that worth something to me? So Carrie's point here, I think, is that art used to be focused on reality. Even ancient stories that used allegory with gods as characters. Um, she's trying to say that our stories now take us away from reality and into a kind of idealism, I think. This didn't make a ton of sense to me. She's saying that modern storytelling 
by taking out the gods and making stories about fictional people who live in our reality, like, I don't know, say a police procedural or something like that, makes people confused and depressed because unlike on a cop show where the bad guys always lose in the end, the reality is that bad guys win all the time. But I think perhaps because of a bad experience she had uh, with media, she's barking up the wrong tree and she's missing a larger, more important point here. It's reality that causes depression, not our stories. Our stories represent how we want reality to be. We want to see Batman rescue the innocent and punish the guilty. You know, that's what brings us a little bit of comfort. Not dwelling on the reality where there is no Batman, and you know the fact that cops are actually murdering thugs who are scarier than the criminals. Frank Miller once said that if Batman was actually real, his crusade against crime would last about five days before he got himself killed. Only children would believe that a Batman could actually exist in reality. No adults think that that would work. Uh, I don't think she's giving humans enough credit here. You hear of kids jumping off of roofs in imitation of Superman, but how often do you hear of adults doing that? And how is a Superman story any different than a Hercules story? I mean, the legends of Hercules mostly took place in Greece, which is a real country, um, so I don't know if she really thought this through. Carrie thinks that we'd be better off embracing reality as it is because it would improve our mental health. I really wonder what the fuck McCarpet is McSmokin'. She goes on to say that books, magazines, and TV took love away from children. This to me is, just seems like more projection of her personal experience onto society. I would really like to see some evidence um, that it was printed or film media that took love away from children. What she means by quote unquote love, I don't even know. So apparently fathers never disappeared before the invention of the TV. Uh, they never went off to fuck other people, or join the military, or just leave to go fishing and never came back. Social media can certainly make one depressed. I mean, there's a reason why I deleted my Facebook page. But it was depressing to me because all of my Facebook friends are selfish assholes. When I would post something about veganism, I wouldn't get any thumbs up, of course, and that was upsetting. It was upsetting because no one cared. But you can't blame one shitty website uh, and say that all technology makes people depressed. I mean, commercials for Arby's make me depressed, but well-written television programs uh, are a source of comfort for me. They provide at least a temporary cure to boredom, for one thing. I mean, what's wrong with using your imagination or using a device to see what someone else's imagination came up with? Do people actually think that TV shows are real? I don't think that's the case. And it just obliterated family life completely. And nobody could see it because, as I think Guy Debord said, it's its own advertisement. So if you are in a room where a family is huddled around a TV screen, you don't see the pathos of them sitting there like zombies because you're also looking at the screen. So it's only been recently when the screens have been too small for the rest of us to see because they're handheld that we've actually seen the spectacle of um, these fossilized casualties wandering around absent from life in an onanistic trance crashing into lampposts. But in my day, like I say, everyone had this ravenous hunger to be famous to the point where we created the demand for reality TV, so we all had a chance of being famous, and then social media because we want to unite with this thing that we can't ever merge with. And that's how the marketers like it, because we're in constant pursuit mode. Now social media has monetized the time that friends used to spend with each other by decanting every social interaction, including sex, it would seem, out of the space-time continuum, since that can't be commercially harnessed, and into a medium that can be wires and screens and server space and all that. They've robbed people of their friends as well and because this level of verisimilitude is even greater than television because it asks the user to interact and collude in the lie that this is reality this is natural behavior to talk over screens people really are too close to the action to see the wolf in grandma's clothing they don't get it what family life is she talking about don't families usually watch tv together uh, my wife and I watch programs together and enjoy discussing the subjects brought up in them. Before that, people had to tell the same stories to each other over and over again, by mouth, 
and or they'd have to do something like describe their dreams. So how is that any different or any better? Again, she's trying to make a broad claim that depression didn't exist before television. A claim that is not even close to being true. People used to watch fires die out or stare at the walls before TV. Did that pastime, quote unquote, obliterate family life? What does family life even mean? What value does family life even have? My dad's family life experience was his father getting drunk and beating him. That was before TV existed. So if they had watched TV instead, that would have been worse somehow to carry. What value does talking to our idiot parents and siblings have exactly? I certainly learned more from TV and books than I did from my parents or even from school. So we should just get rid of mass communication? Now more than ever, we have the technology to omit all of the garbage and only get to the good stuff. Like I find Inmendum videos to be more interesting and informative than most of the TV shows out there. So I get myself a bag of chips, I sit on the couch, and I watch them and think about the content while I'm ingesting it. It's not passive, it's engaged learning through technology. When I first saw Cosmos by Carl Sagan as a kid, it made me more interested in science than any teacher ever did. If you're going to make a statement like TV obliterated family life, you first have to define what is family life, why family life had value, and also prove that TV somehow destroys that value. What even is a family to her? Do my wife and I constitute a family? Or does that mean one has to procreate to have this family thing she values so much? I don't think that Carrie really knows that much about the history of television. Yes, it may make some of us want to be famous, but that existed way before TV. There have always been the popular kids who got all the girls, who got the straight A's, the accolades, the rewards. We're always going to want what others have. This isn't a new thing. Pursuit mode is permanent. The TV viewing audience didn't demand reality TV. Reality TV was invented because the corporations that own TV networks realized that they didn't have to pay union wages to the quote-unquote talent on these shows. And look what happened. Cable networks drove everyone away by charging insane prices so we can watch a bunch of non-actors fake drama interspersed with annoying and offensive advertisements. Netflix offered no ads and higher quality programming, and so the eyes are going there. Sexual encounters in young people are down by 50% in the same time span. In fact, I've seen documentaries where young men say they have to imagine pornography when they're in a real intimate situation because that's what they've been conditioned to respond to. This can only be a good thing. McCarvet failed to say why this is bad. It will result in less pregnancy and therefore less suffering. Less people means less animal abusers, which is what Carrie wants, I thought. The main failure of this video is providing evidence that hanging out in person with people is something that is valuable and worth getting rid of technology for. If you want to make an anti-Facebook video, I think that's great. There's plenty of material to work with for that. But this particular video is the wrong direction. It's been exposed and studied. We know that Facebook can cause depression in many people, but taking us out of reality isn't why. It's an addiction and a waste of time primarily. But for some people, it's a lot of fun and a boredom cure. It just wasn't for me. But that doesn't mean that all of the screens are bad. TV and the internet make the exchange of ideas easier than ever before. Sadly, many of these ideas are of poor quality, but many of them are good. Without the internet, we wouldn't be seeing this worldwide spread of veganism, for example. Why doesn't she mention that? The hero's quest, as Jordan Peterson might put it, is to recognize there are better um, joys in reality and this experience of well-being is something for which you evolved and it is your birthright industry has knowingly attempted and succeeded in closing off the gates in many of our minds to real rewards so that it can con us all with the false rewards of their creation specters that don't exist but keep us in that mode of constantly pursuing them. So McCarpet is just making things up here. She mentions Jordan Peterson a lot in her videos, so I can see where part of her problems are coming from. Well-being, again a word that has no scientific definition, is not our birthright. Where in the DNA code does it say we have a guarantee of comfort? 
We are designed down to our molecules to suffer, to experience pain and anguish. But if we didn't, we wouldn't want to consume so that we can reproduce. People get addicted to social media because they were born addicted. We have needs that need to be gratified. It's life that's the addiction, the source of all of our pain and suffering, not an LCD screen. We can turn the screen off, but the only way to turn off the pain permanently is to kill yourself. Yet, suicide is a harm, and I have beings who depend upon me, so I have to find other ways to cope with this oppressive existence that I didn't even ask for. So that's where meditation and mindfulness come in. I should be doing at least five minutes of meditation every morning, but I usually end up only doing it when I need it, like when I can feel a panic attack coming on. It's been really beneficial for me. Not because it brings reality closer, but because it moves it further away from my consciousness. It's like a mini vacation for my problems. I recommend meditation or mindfulness over SSRIs, Xanax, or alcohol. The more academic approach to mindfulness is called ACT, or Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, and it's really worked for me, so maybe it can for you too. No skill set is going to cure depression or anxiety, but they can make this waking nightmare slightly easier to deal with. So, I do not believe that mass media is the cause of depression. Clearly, birth is. Carrie comes across as a bit of a Luddite in this video. I can see making a video about people who are on Twitter while they're driving as a social problem, um, but do you really think that we should all boycott the internet so we can have face-to-face -face contact with people in our general vicinity? People who are most likely nothing like us? There's an app called Meetup where you can go to have coffee or a beer with a fellow atheist or a vegan or whatever you're into. I've done it a few times and I didn't really get much out of it. So. Should we go back to hand delivering a message to someone instead of emailing it? You can't just say that the internet causes depression without then offering some kind of solution. You know, like she even says in the video, she had to use YouTube to spread her this message. So clearly going back to the word of mouth communication is not a solution. She mentions that young people are going to have to solve the problem. I mean, that's great. That's if it's even solvable in the first place. And this is just something a parent would do. You know, keep on procreating with this false hope that some future generation won't be as selfish and as dumb as you are and will figure it out. It should be obvious to anyone who actually thinks about it, the cause of depression is life, and the only cure is extinction. Thank you for watching. Bye.